Today we are talking with Peter M. Thal, the author of the book, uh, What They Will Never Tell You About the Music Business. The third edition in the paperback, Mr. Thal, uh, welcome to Radara, and we are fortunate to have you for our listeners. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you. Peter has a long history of being in the entertainment industry and um, has a very distinguished track record in the entertainment uh, law practice as well. So, uh, of course, our listeners will be very delighted to find out. Give us, if you can, uh, some context of how complicated music business is or where the complications arise. Well, that is itself a complicated question. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The music business uh, developed over centuries. It, it was only when the British and then uh, eventually every country in the world uh, established copyright laws to protect authors that an actual business uh, developed in, in the whole area of intellectual uh, property, music being just one of the many areas. The importance of adding music and art to the culture was recognized by the founders in the United States Constitution, Article 1. Section 8, one of the very earliest provisions of the uh, of, of the Constitution, actually gives the Congress to establish laws that protect uh, the arts and sciences. So we're talking about not just uh, music, of course, but art, uh, literature, uh, patents, trademarks, uh, the, the whole the whole gamut. Th- this is in the same provision of the Constitution that authorizes the Congress to borrow money, to wage war, to regulate commerce, to, to maintain an army and a navy. But this this provision is uh, extremely important, and it's uh, the basis on which the, the whole entertainment industry uh, uh, depends. I've done work in, in film and television and theater, but I've never found an area of, of intellectual property that's as complex as the music business, and I've, I've enjoyed that. Um, my nature being a musician myself, was was uh, that I would uh, emphasize uh, my practice, my law practice, uh, in, in the area of copyright, but specifically in the area of music. And, um, and among the disciplines within the music business, music publishing uh, is, in my opinion, the most complex. It came to pass early on in my career that I recognized that the people who were looking to earn income in the music business actually did not know or understand or or nor were they aware of any of the uh, intricacies of the very business that they were in they were creative people they lived in a in a world that doesn't exist for anyone else because they see a blank piece of paper or they see a they they close their eyes and dream of a song or a work of art and the next thing you know it's it's uh, manifested in you know on a recording or something the problem that they have is that they do not have the means at their disposal to actually understand their own business I and mean, when when a real estate developer chooses a, a location to build his building uh, he doesn't necessarily recall should be so many stories or should have retail uh, uh, stores in the, in the basement or whatever he knows that this is his business the lawyer is there to make sure that an agreement that the builder makes or the agreements that the builder makes uh, are reduced uh, accurately into writing and enforced. But that's all the lawyer's job is. Not easy, but it's that's what the lawyer does. In the music business and in the entertainment business in general, the lawyer's responsibility is much, much bigger than that. It, it really is is a, is in, in the native person. My interest in in writing this book uh, originally came many decades ago when I realized this, this situation with, with musicians, songwriters, recording artists, and I found that the lawyers, the business managers, the managers, they themselves don't always know or have the perspective of the entire industry. So I decided many years ago to write this book and finally did, and now I suppose you could say that no songwriter, no musician, no record executive can claim ignorance about what the facts are in his business life because this book is available. A couple of other books are on the market that touch on the same subjects, but none in in the kind of uh, broad swath that mine does. Yes, indeed. The table of content itself is so well laid out, and the book is almost 415 pages long and is very richly detailed. 
Well, again, I titled it What They'll Never Tell You About the Music Business because whatever uh, information is available, and many, many uh, professionals, uh, b- again, business managers, accountants, lawyers, managers, even, even the people that creative people are dealing with in the record labels and music publishing companies, they, they may explain some of the facts that surround the the transactions and and the the business realities uh, for these uh, creators, but they usually either will not or do not even understand some of the underlying myths, secrets, (laughs) history of the music business, all of which, when taken together, and I, I hope I've brought much of it together in my book, all of which, when taken together, really constitute a true education. So when when someone has read my book, they will not only know what uh, what are the facts of the music business, but they will they will actually be educated in it almost to the point that they could teach other people, including you know, their children who who may be interested in going into the field. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To a naive person like me, I would think that. Uh, music is just like any other product that is made and that is sold through, uh, and maybe there are a lot of people involved in the industry, unlike many other industry, if I'm making a toothpaste or I'm making uh, an automobile or I'm making a plane, how music is different from these products that a naive person doesn't understand that why it becomes so complex? That's an interesting question. Um, sometimes I refer to the music business has nothing more than any of these other businesses, the shoe business or whatever. Uh, they all have their uh, idiosyncrasies. They all have their history. They have all gone through uh, uh, difficult periods where lessons have been learned, etc. But the, the distinction in this area, it's not just music, it's intellectual property in general, is that you're not dealing with something that is that is tangible. You're dealing with an idea. You're dealing with something that doesn't exist. You can't grab it. You can't touch it. You can't break it. You can't bite it. <laughs> it's but you can it's an it. idea. It's intellectual property, and it's a very hard thing for people to conceive of. As I was just saying, adding to what you were saying, you can feel it, and and, and very similar probably to a music uh, to a software industry. Well, software has become a very broad term now that includes movies and many other things that are copyrighted, but. Why music industry always have a situation where the songwriters or the people who create music always end up at the receiving end, unlike if you're a software publisher or you write a very beautiful piece of code that may be used by Google or somebody else. Well, let's say if I'm a songwriter and I write a song and then somebody will use the song and then create a beautiful, uh, I guess, uh, uh, music and record it and sell it. Whereas if I'm uh, on on the other side, if let's say if I'm a programmer and I write a a very intelligent program uh, or a code, uh, I become a billionaire like uh, Bill Gates, but that would never happen with a songwriter. Well, it does happen and it can happen with a songwriter. Again, I I take you back to the Constitution, which said that the Congress is to promote the progress of, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, to promote the progress of, of the arts by uh, securing for limited times, which is an arguable phrase, for securing by securing to authors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So it, it encourages creation, it encourages the expansion of the culture by virtue of the fact that it provides for exclusive rights and the exclusive rights mean that the creators can actually earn money um, from the uh, exploitation of, of their creations. That is the distinction. And without that exclusivity, without that um, protection, without that asset that is established ultimately via the Constitution, it is said, correctly or otherwise, that there would be no creation. Uh, for example, going back a few hundred years, Mozart would take Haydn uh, melodies and develop variations on them. It, but that led him to, to develop his own musicianship, his own competence as a composer, and he went on to write operas and symphonies and whatever. He took what went before him. That would not happen today because they would be sued. And therefore, there would be what is what, what lawyers like to call a chilling effect on uh, great income from the creation, 
and therefore um, right laws of the world uh, aim to uh, to protect. Yeah, that does make sense. In chapter four, uh, you talk about royalties and some unvarnished truths. So give us a little bit of nuanced understanding that how royalties percolate down and who gets more and who doesn't get. Well, the whole concept of of royalties is um, fraught with problems because it it assumes that the uh, the company that is paying the royalties. Um, Owns the and, and and almost has actually created the asset in the, in the first place, which of course it hasn't. So when a record company signs an artist, they don't say, "Look, we'll pay for the recording, and you'll essentially pr- provide or contribute the value of your authorship, and then together we will be partners and we will share in the profits." That is not the way it works. The way it works is that the record companies pay for the product. The artist is promised a royalty, which would be a percentage of sales, and they both go on their merry way. Now, what happens in the record industry is that the cost of the recording, the cost of promotion, the cost of videos, and many other costs, assistance in touring, et cetera, that all, all of which is, uh, is, is to advance the, uh, the fame of the artist and the, and the productivity of, of the, uh, the uh, artist. A- after all of that, the record company takes out of the royalties, takes back out of the royalties, all of the costs that it has advanced. Which means that the artist actually ends up, if, assuming there's some success. If there's no success, the record company loses, and the artist goes his merry way. But if there's success, the uh, artist ends up paying for his own rec- or her own recording and touring and videos share of the profits is minuscule compared to what the record company obtains now the record company claims well you know 99 out of 100 of these don't succeed anyway not that they have anything to do with failure of course but the truth is that uh, if if i am a songwriter uh, and i look to a music publisher to give me money to help me exist and write the music publisher ends up owning some are all of my copyrights. Therefore, you know, without getting into too many details, if 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 I'm paid a um, hundred thousand uh, dollars as as uh, as a fee to write songs, and I write a song that earns, let's say, a hundred thousand uh, dollars, then I have to pay half of that to the publisher. But fine, or maybe less. But the main thing is that at that moment, when the when the hundred thousand dollar has come in, I mean the music publishing company, they've gotten their money back from the writer, so they haven't lost anything. But at that moment, they suddenly own a copyright that can be worth ten to fifteen times that earning. So it can be worth a million to a million and a half dollars. That as an asset that they're sitting on that they can sell or they can borrow on and build a nice building or pay their executives lots of money. And the and the author, the composer or the lyricist, will have paid back all of the advance, and yet he won't own anything. Mm-hmm. This is the same. It works that way in the record industry, and it works that way in the, uh, in the publishing industry, which are the, basically two of the three areas of... of uh, uh, exploitation of of copyrights in in the music business. So will that be changed, or what it will take to change that? I don't think it will ever change. The it's too ingrained, and an artist will always need the help of a record company, and the record company has the leverage and says, if you if you want my help, if you want me to record for you, uh, you pay the recording uh, at the. Electric Lady Studios, then it has to be this way. Now there are there are ways that lawyers can can adjust the weight, the balance of the deal, um, especially as time goes on. Maybe they will lose badly on the first or second album and begin to catch up after that, but they'll never catch up. The only way to answer your question that this will change or has already changed is that given the internet and and given the, the incredible low cost of recording the artists nowadays have so many means of recording in their own homes and they have the means to exploit them through soundcloud and through 
uh, licenses to Spotify, Pandora, whatever. It it still has yet to be proven. This this rapper Chance, you know, aside, <laughs> who's done it without a major record label, uh, it still has to be proven pretty much that anyone doing it themselves can even dream of of the level of success that one sees with with uh, Adele or or uh, Bruno Mars or Bruce Springsteen or you know just Bandada, you name it. Creative people know how to create, uh, but then they need to understand how to manage their own business and financial future. And you go at great length in explaining in the how to select a personal manager and when show me the money isn't enough and when is your job more than a gig. If you want to kind of summarize all that, and that would be very valuable. Well, this book, what they'll never tell you about the music business, is exactly what it says. It it is a very um, comprehensive treatment of absolutely every subject that can possibly come up in in an artist's life or in a, the life of a uh, an executive in the industry or a lawyer. Um, so it's very hard to, to answer your question in, in, in a short amount of time, but let, let's break it down, talk about managers. Uh, there is no school for managers. There are no licenses required for managers as there are for lawyers, accountants, and even dogs. Managers uh, are self-generating in most cases. They start off uh, maybe uh, working in college, uh, bringing some acts to their colleges, and then they they start work they start discovering their own artists and then they develop uh, according to their own abilities and interests they develop uh, their own definition of what a manager does for an artist which can be very very valuable the problem is that managers work for free and as a result they require and are and deserve um, to enter into written agreements with artists that provide that if there is a, a successful uh, mentoring of the artist's career, that then the, the to really break down what kind of manager you need. If you're a starting artist, you need someone who has a van and can take you to the, the little clubs. Uh, as, as time goes on, you become uh, an artist playing uh, the big cities, maybe in Europe, and a manager either learns as he goes or get some guidance maybe from uh, his uh, lawyer or his agent. Then you have the arena size artists, and then you have the stadium size artists, and you're talking about a staff of hundreds of people. Sometimes you've got, I remember a Rolling Stones tour um, had, I think, 25 18-wheeler uh, uh, trucks uh, carrying their stage and scenery and equipment and people around. A manager who works out of a van and without an office and with no money from the artist it, it has different skills and, and needs to have different skills. There is the uh, eventual ultimate end of one's career. And the question then is, well, what happens after the career is over? The artist is retired, the artist is no longer selling, the artist has died perhaps. What happens to the assets left behind, the recordings, which the artist doesn't even own, remember? Uh, who manages the aftermath? Who, who manages the catalog? Who puts out, who makes sure that the record company even knows that there's a market for uh, a greatest uh, hits or the the ultimate you know fill in the blank artist uh, records like, like Rhino the Warner uh, uh, Legacy Company uh, puts out or or Sony Legacy uh, look at the way Bob Dylan has has uh, advanced his legend through regular releases of of earlier recordings when his current recordings really are are, are not much of a factor in in uh, his uh, financial life. So that that deals with managers as far as uh, what to do with income uh, or or the lack of it. Uh, that's a big problem for people who've never had money before. You see you see problems arise in in, in the sports field uh, with with uh, athletes who suddenly make a lot of money and have people guiding them or not guiding them, all of whom should be paid for their services and all of whom make sure they're paid for their services. <laughs> the the uh the fact that 
there are people around the artists who who whose success and income is dependent on the artist's income uh, creates a built-in conflict of interest that 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 doesn't apply so much to lawyers who charge hourly rates, for example, or flat fees from projects, but it it does apply to anyone who's on a percentage. So, for example, I talk in my book about a business manager who decides to keep his own clients poor. Uh, the the keep them poor philosophy, which is to say, if they want to buy a house they can't afford, he get a mortgage in 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 a day. If he wants to buy a fancy car, he'll get the car by noon. Before you know it, he's spending you know, all his money. Um, he's not focused on saving for retirement or for that day when the $50,000 bills stop flying in the window, which they will, uh, he's spending his money. He's enjoying it. He's having good life. The business manager says, you know, why why should I destroy this man's, you know, or this woman's uh, dreams? I'll let them buy the Porsche they want or, or the house they want or the country house or the beach house or the uh, or, or take $25,000 vacations in St. Bart's. Um, but there are those business managers who don't mind keeping their artists poor, their clients poor. And that requires that the artists go back on the road and or start recording again and start making money again. Once they make money, that's gross income. Once they have gross income, guess what? The manager commissions it. The business manager commissions it. Nowadays, the record company commissions it. And... Um, and sometimes, uh, particularly in California, the lawyers commission it. Um, you take a uh, uh, an artist who performs, let's say, at Madison Square Garden and gets a fee of a hundred thousand dollars for the evening. Uh, that person has to pay, keeping it low, has to pay fifteen thousand dollars to his manager, five thousand dollars to his business manager. $5,000 at least to his lawyer because playing the garden is a very costly project. So that's already $25,000. Then then he's he's got to pay for the cost of his uh, travel and team or staff or band. If, if this $100,000 fee, if 50000 of it went to costs, and as I said, twenty-five thousand goes to commissions. That that leaves the artist with twenty-five thousand. If the manager messes up, or the business manager miscalculates, or the lawyer forgets to protect uh, the merchandise agreement or whatever, and this tour, or this in in this example, this this one concert is essentially a failure. And and from what I understand, to play Madison Square Garden is usually a losing proposition. Then the the artist could end up with nothing or owing money. So and even as the manager and business manager and lawyer receive their percentages of gross, and the the poorer the artist is, the more likely he's going to go back to work. Mm-hmm. You see it all the time. You know, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Very well said, and that leads us to the uh, the next part of him. If you can give us a little bit of uh, uh, overview of uh, what it takes to get your records heard. I mean, there's, there are a lot of things that goes into marketing and promotion, and nowadays with the advent of internet and YouTube, things the level uh, playing field or the battlefield has changed. Well, that is. Um I'm <laughs> sorry to say, it's another complicated question. <laughs> um, and I say that because there's so many opportunities now that never existed before. So that's, that's, that's the good news. Um, the, the cost of recording, as I said, can be very, very, uh, low if, if you have the, you know, the minimal equipment. You can't, uh, necessarily reach the masses that I was talking about with when the, with that the big labels uh, are are uh, equipped to to do, but there are outlets nowadays. People count followers or listeners on SoundCloud and on iTunes on a whole variety of other uh, platforms. The follow up of that can really ultimately end in the same place that promotion always ended in the music business, which is radio. If these 
songs that have developed a what, what we call a, a bubbling under effect and have a, a been uh, adopted by a base of people in, in a town or in the country, but never get the broad distribution through radio and and through the ability um, of the team around the artist to get the artist out there performing on television, uh, through videos, through YouTube. And, and if the whole thing is not well coordinated and and if and even lucky. It, it's very, very difficult, being that you can't make a living. And sometimes these artists, and, and maybe all of us on some level, we, we want to be as successful as we can possibly be. Well, we're not. Most of us have a good job or a good profession. We make a good living if we're lucky. Um, it's not all of us who end up uh, in the billionaire st- uh, state, <laughs> and for good reason. But putting that aside, artists have to recognize that if they love what they're doing, if they're creating art for their own sake and, and for the sake of others and, and to earn money so they can eat and put shelter over their heads and whatever, and they enjoy touring and they enjoy communicating with fans and, and relating and learning from the reaction of fans to their performances so that they, they're constantly improving. If an artist is like that and that's successful for them on the East Coast and nationally uh, in Europe, what's wrong with that? It's a living and it's a living doing what they want and mm-hmm. how they want it. You, you and I might not want to be on the road and in the small towns in Germany, like a number of my clients are every summer. There, there's a band called Twisted Sister, which we all know. I, I assume people listening might know them. I mean, their their heyday is long over, but they are so respected and so loved in Europe, which is a very loyal community. They get themselves together again every summer, and they play for a month in Holland and Sweden and Germany and make a good amount of money for themselves. Uh, there, there are enormous, uh, I mean, again, to answer your question, there are enormous opportunities for reaching uh, an audience that will, that will help generate income for an artist. And getting back to what I was saying about the managers, some managers figure out how to do that. Justin Bieber's manager did. Someone else might not have probably wouldn't have there, there there's a lot of trouble out there the artists being sued like a, a sheeran uh or uh a robin thick bruno mars uh even led zeppelin 45 years later the the uh, royalties that songwriters receive from uh streaming for example um because they are controlled their their rights are controlled by the Justice Department rules from from 1940 and other other uh, laws from 1909. They are making uh, songwriters are making one fourteenth what artists make when their record is streamed. And how's that possible? And it's possible because songwriters are affected and regulated for some good reasons. Uh, by the Justice Department, and our recording artists are not. So recording artists can go out into the world uh, with their record labels and, and negotiate in a free market and what we call a willing buyer and a willing seller, and they can negotiate a rate. So they'll, they'll negotiate 14 cents for something. The songwriters cannot do that. They have to go to a, a, a federal court and ask, them to establish a rate for themselves and they, they point out what the record labels and the artists receive 14 cents and the judges have been saying well that's that's okay but even though without the song the record companies and the artists would have nothing because <laughs> the song is the be all and end all after all of, of music uh, we're going to let you charge or require that you charge only one cent so I know most people don't know this, but there there is some talk and, and some press on the issue of uh, improving the uh, the ability of the songwriters and their, and their publishers to uh, negotiate in the free market. The only time that recording artists and record labels on the one hand and songwriters and music publishers on the other are actually both in the free market 
is in what is called synchronization uh, licensing, which is to say the use of a sound recording and the underlying song, of course, it's built into the sound recording in a film or in a commercial or something visual, so it's an audiovisual work. In that area, there are no regulations by the Justice Department. There are no laws from 1909 that, that apply. So as a result, they negotiate freely. And guess what? When they negotiate freely, they end up with 50 cents on the dollar for the record company and the artists and 50 cents on the dollar for the publisher and the songwriters. And yet, in all other areas of music uh, exploitation, uh, except print music, the parties uh, are not equal. How much uh, money YouTube is paying? Why Why could this person in, in the, um, the Blurred Lines case, where the uh, author had actually died and the trust handling the author's royalties and rights sued for uh, a, Mar a Marvin Gaye uh, uh, infringement. And the expert witness for the plaintiff, the Marvin Gaye side, testified the songs were very much the same. But they're not. I mean, I say that as a musician. I'm entitled to my opinion. What's the same or, or what's similar or substantially similar, which is the test you have to have to follow, what's substantially similar is the feel, that one song feels a bit like the other. But feeling is not copyrightable. And yet, the Robin Thicke and, and uh, Bruno Mars lost that case. The appeal is on. Everyone in the industry expects that case to be reversed because that would that would and has already opened up a, a, a floodgate of people suing each other. Um, and then another case that came up in 2014 was the uh, case involving the uh, screenwriter of a film, Raging Bull, who assigned his rights to MGM, but he died before his additional rights matured. And his wife uh, inherited the, or his widow inherited the the additional rights, and she sued. Thirty years later, uh, MGM, and where I went to law school, and where I read the copyright law, the the statute of limitations for suing someone in copyright infringement is three years. Mm -hmm. And in 2014, the Supreme Court said, yes, it's three years. But that means you can go back only three years for money. But you can sue 40 years later. So there, everybody's coming out of the woodwork now and suing. Uh, the, the Stairway to Heaven case is an example. You know, my my book goes into it very slightly. But th this is a, an industry. The music music is our culture. I could go on about how some people think that because it's our culture, it should be free. But as I said at the beginning of our conversation, the Constitution itself understands that. If it, if it were free, there would be no music. Yeah, very well said. Do you think a free market would do good or harm to songwriters, for songwriters? Uh, I think it would do good. I, I think I, on some level, uh, there has to be some control. When I when I mentioned that songwriters are controlled or regulated, uh, and, s and some of that is a good thing, what I mean is that um, there, there are hundreds of thousands, uh, if not a, a million, songwriters uh, in the country, there are an incredible number of users of music, and if a user had to go to any individual songwriter to have the permission to perform a song, it would be uh, an impossibility. So the government recognized this and said, "Look, it, 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 we're going to help. We're going to create a monopoly, or we're going to allow ASCAP and BMI and these societies to create monopolies. They will, they will own everything. They will control all the performing rights." If you want to use music in your gas station or in your state fair or in your on your radio, on your television, whatever, you're going to have to get permission, but you don't have to go to all million people. You can go to one or two. So regulation is essential, but the, 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 the restrictions on ASCAP and BMI are so serious that they almost impede competition rather than avoid it, which is, of course, what the Justice Department's theoretical job is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You were just leading into the uh, YouTube situation, and uh, YouTube is not very well known for paying you a lot of money, unlike even poorer than what a recording studio would pay. 
would you go a little bit into nuance? What is happening there? YouTube is becoming more and more has already become very powerful and useful, and and as as it gains momentum, even momentum even more. I think people who provide music there has is going to have even more challenges. Well, th this is going to work itself out. It's an evolving area, obviously. And uh, right now, there are 21 billion total videos on YouTube, which is about 400 million years worth of time spent on YouTube. It's a very popular site, you know, needless to say. But what they pay out is minuscule, as as we've all read. So different art, Bette Midler, whatever, other artists, they say, you know, my, my song was played a million times and I received a check for $2. Th this is going to have to be dealt with. Now, Spotify also pays uh, very low, but Spotify is still losing money because they only have 30 million subscribers. Once they have 100 million, they'll be in profit. But in the meantime, they're paying out to the record companies, remember, 14 cents to every penny they're, they're paying out to songwriters. So they they have a tremendous burden already, and that's why they're losing money. And yet songwriters are, are being shortchanged, to say the least. The other thing is that these huge companies, Google and, and uh, Apple, even Microsoft, the, the entire music industry's gross income is, is a drop in the bucket of Apple's gross income every year. <laughs> um, but they use music as a loss leader. It sells equipment and it sells advertising. And there's much more money in that than uh, than is turned around and paid to songwriters and, and the record labels. But again, the record labels can negotiate in a free market and the songwriters cannot. So I, I think it's going to work itself out. There probably will have to be legislation, but even some of the friends of copyright, so to speak, uh, are, are wavering in their support of songwriters um, these days, particularly Congressman Sensenbrenner, who used to be the head of a, a copyright committee, is now supporting what we in the industry pretty much call an in, insane uh, ruling by the uh, Department of Justice uh, a week or two ago. So it's going to be a long struggle. And um, look, we are on this call to talk about the book, what they'll never tell you about the music business. Why is the book relevant? It's relevant because it has the fundamentals that will always be part and the basis for this incredible industry. There are a few books on the market that will explain what ASCAP does and what mechanical royalty is, and you know basic things that need to be need to be known. But my book uh, not only no, it covers that, of course, but it goes into this you know, serious, deeper levels of fundamentals, so that uh, an, an artist uh, or a songwriter will not be uh, taken advantage of. And it goes very much in the detail on the copyright issues as well. There are several chapters on it which are very helpful to a, to a budding artist or an established artist too. There, there's a, a world of uh, resistance to uh, copyright. <laughs> I shouldn't say a world of, there's a partial world of resistance to copyright, copyright protection. A lot of people think that copyright is a way of taking away their culture. That culture, is, you know, music music is their culture, and my culture is mine, and you can't charge me for it. Well, again, that that's not the way it works, and there will always be an element in the world that that feels that way. But as, as I, I, I gave a lecture a few years ago at the um, University of Hamburg, it was mostly about what was happening at that time when the recording industry of America was suing uh, kids and grandmothers and whatever for infringing copyrights, which they were. But in that lecture, I compared stealing <laughs> and the passion for music with uh, Medea, the Greek uh, um, sorceress, mm -hmm. uh, who was so uh, angry with uh, her husband, uh, Jason, for running off with another woman that... Uh, she killed her children, and you might say that that's not exactly a normal thing to do. But um, she felt this passion, and 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 she even said that I, I didn't even see them as children anymore. I saw them as an example of 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 this guy's behavior. So again, the the, the population feels very passionate about their culture, and 
we have to recognize that. What will they do if they are not offered their their culture at a reasonable price, like streaming or downloads? They will find a way uh, to obtain it through peer-to-peer uh, downloading and, and sharing. That's what they did. And uh, and until it, and, and until there was an option, an opportunity for the population to obtain their music at a reasonable price, that's what they did. And then the RIAA, instead of encouraging the record labels, which they represent and they that form the RIAA, the Recording Industry Association, instead of doing that, they decided to sue everybody, which didn't go over very well. But the desire for free music is it co- it covers the you know the whole world we we think music is free on the radio but of course it's not so we don't understand why we have to pay for uh pandora for example but people pay for water you know but they don't want to pay for music they pay for electricity but they don't want to pay for music and, it, and part of it is a necessity of the copyright industry to to educate the public and the public changes every year more people are born more people come into the into the mix and they have to continue to be educated sampling is a very good example of stealing uh, judge sweet in new york federal court years ago when he when he saw it he said looks like stealing to me and that was the end of it for a very long time kanye west samples all the time takes music of other people uses it loops it around does it by way of sound recording or just the song that he himself performs. Then he contacts the owners occasionally after the fact, after the record's released, and says, you know, I want to pay you $2 to use your sample, and they turn around and they sue him. There there should be a, a method legislatively that can assist uh, or even monetize sampling in a way that's reasonable for everybody because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Mozart did it, Brahms did it, everybody did it, and everybody does it today, especially in the rap field. It's part it's part of their culture, and it's it's how they uh, g- uh, generate uh, music. But Kanye West, you know, is getting sued right and left. Madonna, on the other hand, had had uh, also uh, sampled something, and that went to federal court. And lo and behold, uh, the court said this was uh, what they called de minimis. This was this was really really nothing. It was so insignificant. Other cases have said even one note, for example, a sound note, not a written note, is is stolen. It, then it's stolen. It's part of the copyright. Fascinating. We've been talking with Peter M. Thal, the author of What They Will Never Tell You About the Music Business. So much about the book and so much about the industry, the music industry. Give us a little bit of understanding of how did you get involved in the entertainment law and the music industry? What brought you there? I know you graduated from Columbia and probably continued to pursue your passion of legal services and the music industry. At some point, they converged. Well, I'll answer that, but I have to say that most lawyers in my experience who are in this field were themselves musicians or they just madly loved music to the point that if they were going to be lawyers this is the kind of lawyer they wanted to be and schools law schools business schools undergraduate music and business departments of universities and uh, it is encouraging a lot of people to go into the field who who are naturally inclined and don't want to be doing Boeing aircraft leases at three o'clock in the morning for the rest of their lives. They like to be associated with creative people because they are so interesting and, you know, deal with, as I said earlier, blank pages and create out of nothing. My own story is, is not too far away from that, except it, it started off with a, uh, a little, uh, little boost. Uh, when I was in high school, I had set uh, the Gettysburg Address to music, which was something I did for reasons I don't know exactly, but <laughs> my great grandfather was in the Civil War, and I think it was a rainy day, and I had nothing to do, and my father suggested it, so I did, and it got some uh, publicity. It became a personal interest story because I was only 13, 14, and then by the time I was 16, it was performed at a joint session of Congress, and got some play on the news and CBS Network and 
New York Times did a story, and it was that was my 15 minutes of fame, and long long to be forgotten. Except here, I'm still talking about it. <laughs> but what happened was that when I was a senior in high school, my principal called me to the office, and there was a United States Marshal there serving me with a copyright infringement lawsuit from a person in Chicago who had himself set the Gettysburg Address to music 30 or 40 years earlier. His claim was bogus. I had never heard his music, and the music wasn't at all alike. But that didn't matter under the law at the time in our in our area. I'm from Connecticut, and the Second Circuit out of New York controls the law of that area. And the, the uh, case went to trial. It was a five-day trial. The jury hung. They couldn't decide if I had stolen the music or not. The judge was incensed, found out that two of the jury members were hard of hearing, <laughs> and didn't couldn't imagine that somebody so young could have written something so wonderful. I'm not sure if it was wonderful, but that's what he that's what he said. And he directed the verdict in my favor. I won, and that was the end of that. But meanwhile, I was now in college and thinking about being a lawyer my whole life. I thought, well, if I'm going to be a lawyer, I think I'll be a copyright lawyer. So I went to a law school that specialized in copyright, George Washington. And uh, going to a national law school out of New York City is not the best way to get a job in New York City. But I got a job at ASCAP in the law department, and that gave me a, a few years to observe the practice of music law in New York, which was really a very fledgling size at the time. And uh, and I picked and chose a firm that was in the forefront of uh, development of really high-quality uh, legal services to musicians like Simon and Garfunkel and uh, Miles Davis, uh, Frank Lesser wrote Guys and Dolls. So I, I, I was, I, I moved over to that firm, and the, you know, the rest is history. I just developed my interest in uh, music and musicians and composers, classical as well. Many people say this is the best of times for classical music because of the internet and uh, live and HD performances all over the world. More people buy tickets to the Metropolitan Opera every year than buy Yankee tickets. Hard to believe. Nobody knows that. Wow. No, you do. <laughs> that, that there's, a, there's, there's hope for the classical music industry. <laughs> Well, you've written a wonderful book that I think every upcoming artist or the artist coming in the next year or decades would find it very useful. Well, without being unduly promotive, the book really is for many other people in the industry than just songwriters and, and uh, artists. It's for producers, managers, industry executives, lawyers, investors. I talk about valuation of, of copyright catalogs, which Wall Street is now paying a lot of attention to it, it's good for accountants in other words there there are rarely top executives in the industry who've read the book who haven't told me i didn't you know, quote i didn't know that and these these are top executives and they didn't know the basics of for example music publishing or or vice versa if they're in the publishing business they didn't understand the basics of the recording uh, industry and if they're in the recording industry they didn't understand the basics of touring. So this is this book has, has a very broad um, appeal and should be read by, by everybody in the industry. It touches everyone in the ecosystem of creating a muse and bringing it to your ears. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Thank you very much. Thank you again. And please do keep us in mind when you have a fourth edition. I shall. I shall. Thank you for calling. Thank you.